He's not unmuting. Yes. Uh, Steve, can you hear me? You need to unmute yourself. Aren't you? Okay. Is that better? Got it. Okay, Sarah. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you everybody for, for attending and uh, let's, let's get going. This is a, uh, a course on, on Mars, the planet Mars, the uh, past, the present, and the future. Uh, the, uh, most of you know who I am. I'm, I've, been a, I've been a professor at FSU since 1969 and became emeritus when I retired uh, about 14, 15 years ago. Uh, from the beginning, I was an associate of the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Institute at FSU, uh, where we studied uh, the fluid dynamics of geophysical processes, ocean, atmosphere, and earth interior. Uh, since then, we have also included uh, uh, the fluid dynamics of other planets. I'm a member of the Senior Center Advisory Council. I, was, I started that about a year and a half ago, and I, I love doing it. It's a great organization. This is what we'll be doing for the next three weeks uh, on these Tuesday afternoons. Uh, there are uh, three main topics. Usually uh, one of these we cover in each of the three weeks, although uh, we'll have some flexibility in case we run a little short or a little, or a little long of, of moving some of the topics from one to another. Today we'll be focusing on an overview of the program, how Mars has affected our culture, our world culture, looking at what the ancients did in the study of Mars, and then moving on to the Renaissance, how the Renaissance uh, uh, people uh, furthered the development of our understanding of Mars. Uh, the second main topic, past missions to Mars, this starts around 1960 during the space age, and we'll be looking at the, uh, the study of the atmosphere, the moons, and the geology of Mars. Of course, geology technically should mean Earth study, not Mars study, but uh, people have used geology even to refer to uh, the structure, internal structure of other planets. Uh, the third one will be uh, uh, more speculative. Uh, the, in, in 2020, that's this year, there's going to be a mission to Mars. It's actually supposed to uh, lift off in about a month from now. This is very good timing. And uh, one of the issues here, of course, is, uh, is can, can people uh, live on Mars? Well, one of the main issues is uh, why bother? You know, Mars is pretty far away. Uh, we have enough problems on Earth without having to speculate and worry about the things that are happening in other planets. But let's actually look at a, a very nice, about seven or eight minute video. there has been a fascination, an expectation to physically go to Mars. It isn't specific to one culture or one era. It permeates through us. This idea of visiting the red planet, given that name because of the iron oxide on its surface. It has been a part of culture for a very long time. In literature, all the way back to the 1600s. In film in 1910, with the Thomas Edison produced A Trip to Mars, one of the first science fiction movies ever made. And more recently in video games like Doom, Red Faction, and Destiny. And of course on television in the series Mars on National Geographic. In reality, we've been coming up with plans to go to that bright spot in the sky that at its closest is 33.9 million miles away, and at its farthest, 249 million miles away for over 65 years. The first being the Mars Project, written by physicist and engineer Werner von Braun in 1948. It detailed and outlined how to get a manned mission to Mars. His hope was that it could be done by 1965, four years before the moon landing. Since the publication of the Mars Project, there have been over 60 other plans by government organizations and scientists to get human beings on the surface of the planet. During all those years, we have sent landers and rovers to Mars. First, the Soviet Union sent Mars 2 and Mars 3. Neither were successful, with Mars 2 holding the title of being the first man-made object on the surface of Mars and simultaneously the first man-made object to crash into the surface of Mars. Then there was the Viking 1 lander in 1976, which was not only the first spacecraft to actually land on Mars and complete its mission, but also gave us this, the first photograph ever from the surface of Mars. Skip ahead 21 years to Sojourner, 
the first successful rover mission. Then there was Spirit and Opportunity, and quick side note on Spirit, its mission was for about 90 Martian solar days, or about 92 Earth days, but functioned for over six years thanks to cleaning events, winds blowing the Martian dust off of the rover's solar panels. And then Spirit got stuck. But we'll get back to that in a minute. The most recent rover is Curiosity, which instead of being solar powered like Spirit and Opportunity, is powered by a nuclear generator and has more Twitter followers than most humans. Now back to Opportunity. It's been in operation for almost 13 years, about 50 times longer than originally designed. But during that time, the rover has only traveled a distance of 26 miles. It's been said that what a rover could do in six months, a human could do in two hours. What took Opportunity 13 years to accomplish a distance, a human could do in one day. And that's not to discredit what the rovers have been able to accomplish. They've discovered some key ingredients to life on the planet, like oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and sulfur. And they've measured the radiation on Mars, so when we do send humans, we have a better understanding of the environment we will be entering. But the rovers have just scratched the surface, literally. Spirit got stuck in some soft soil during its mission. In order to get it, three engineers from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory took an identical rover and put it in as close to the same situation as they could, going so far as to recreate the effects of reduced gravity. All this in an attempt to try and solve how to get Spirit unstuck. They weren't able to figure out a way, but this highlights an advantage of human versus machine. A human would be able to get itself out of that situation. Not to mention a human wouldn't have to wait 26 minutes to get its next command. Well, it would range between 8 minutes and 48 minutes, depending on Mars' distance from Earth. It takes anywhere from 4 minutes to 24 minutes to send a message to Earth in that same amount of time to get it back. And that's the thing. The rovers move by command. They extend their arm by command. Every action is dictated by a person on Earth. So not only is there the time delay between sending and receiving, but also the time to decide the best course of action. You don't have to give a human a command to walk forward 100 centimeters. Humans can be much better robots than a robot. But Jake, you say, you still haven't answered the question of why Mars. Well, good point. So let's break it down. Starting with why not another planet? Why not Venus? Venus is closer than Mars at 26 million miles from Earth at its closest point, and 160 million at its furthest. It is also 80% the mass of Earth, and has 90% the gravity versus Mars, which is 10 times smaller, and has 38% the gravity. Venus is often considered to be Earth's twin, but it also has a surface temperature of 864 degrees Fahrenheit, hot enough to melt lead, and the surface pressure is 92 bar. To put that into perspective, 92 would be about the same pressure as going a thousand feet deep into the ocean. It would be crushing. Every lander or probe sent to the surface had a fairly short life, with the longest one lasting only two hours before being destroyed by the environment. Now, if you go 31 miles above the surface, it isn't as bad with similar pressure, gravity, and radiation protection, which is why NASA has havoc. The High Altitude Venus Operational Concept, a kind of floating city science lab. The general consensus is, in terms of planets in our solar system, a lot of them don't have the proper temperature. They're too hot or too cold, they're too far away or some of them just lack a surface for us to stand on. So in terms of planets in our solar system, Mars becomes the obvious destination. Okay, so we send humans to Mars to conduct experiments much more rapidly and much more impactfully than a rover could. A human could drill into the polar ice caps and find out what the atmosphere was like back when Mars did have liquid water on its surface. We could find out if there was still liquid water under the surface, and in doing so, discover life even on the smallest level. And then this brings up the obvious next question. How do we live there? Since Mars has much less gravity than Earth, your bones and muscles would decay away at a significant rate. So we terraform the planet. Cool terraforming fact. It was generally called planetary engineering up until 1982 when the term terraforming was popularized. There are a few different proposed methods for terraforming Mars. Some involve giant orbital mirrors to warm the surface of the planet. Others include melting the ice caps directing small asteroids to impact Mars, basically we would create global warming on Mars. And it would take a long time. In senior NASA scientist Christopher McKay's paper, Planetary Ecosynthesis on Mars, he suggests that producing an oxygen-rich atmosphere would take more than 100,000 years using current technology. Other researchers have suggested only 500 to 1,000 years. 
not to mention that terraforming the planet would most likely kill anything currently alive on it. But as astrophysicist Matt O'Dowd told me, who needs to build a sky if you can build a roof? Vast extended covered habitats. And recently, NASA selected six companies to create prototypes. Or maybe the first explorers of Mars live underground. Let me try and answer the question that I first asked. Why Mars? I think that's a bit of a trick question because yes, it is about furthering our understanding of life in our solar system. Is there? Has there been other life besides our own? The significance that that would have and the other mysteries we would uncover would be revolutionary, would be world changing. But when asking ourselves why go to Mars, I think about what Benjamin Franklin said on one of the first manned flights, the hot air balloon run, when he was asked why. He said, what use is a newborn baby? It is a beginning. It is the first step that turns into something greater. To go to Mars, it takes all of us from all different countries, from all different backgrounds. It is called the International Space Station, not the American Space Station or the Japanese Space Station. When we come together for a common goal, we can achieve anything. We really can. Even if it's just planting the seed of human life on Mars, no matter how seemingly small, it will grow into something that we could have never imagined. And those branches will extend into the rest of our solar system and into our galaxy and so on and so forth. Going to the moon pumped blood and new enthusiasm for science and engineering and our own world. Think about what stepping foot on another planet would do. As the famous polar explorer Sir Ernest Shackleton said, optimism is true moral courage. Difficulties are just things to overcome. And as always, thanks for watching. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. Uh, we have, you know, comments or questions, please use the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the chat facility. Okay, uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, now NASA also has been asked this question, why Mars? You've got to remember that NASA has a vested interest, uh, like money. Uh, uh, so you have to kind of be careful in interpreting what they say. A couple of them I think are worth looking at. Uh, and Mars has characteristics similar to Earth's. Well, what's nice about that is that now you have, in science we call it control, a certain things we see on Earth and it'd be nice if we could understand uh, why those things exist or why they are what they are. And uh, so Mars could be a control. I don't think that's a big deal, but it, it, it is something to consider. Uh, there are some issues involved with uh, doing uh, work on a, on a large project does have a lot of unexpected technical and economic consequences. Some of them are good. A lot of things that we now take for granted uh, and our current situation uh, have really been developed through uh, using a large science or large technology. And uh, the next last thing there says that it drives innovation. And the last one I think is interesting, and most people don't think about that, is that having a large project like going to Mars or other projects uh, encourages nations to work together. We probably did a little bit more of that going on now in, in, in the world. We actually saw a little bit of that in the uh, recent movie, uh, The Martian. Uh, now, uh, most of you probably already know that goes very quickly. Uh, what, what are Mars properties relative to the Earth? Well, rotation periods are almost the same. Uh, the Earth, uh, the day, length of day on the Earth is 24 hours and Mars is about 24 and a half hours. The planetary tilts on both are virtually the same number of degrees. And what this means is that the, uh, the day-night cycle is gonna look a lot alike and the uh, seasons are gonna look a lot alike, not in details of temperature, but in, in length and uh, in number of seasons. The eccentricity, this is a big, a big deal. Mars eccentricity, that is the, uh, the extent to which uh, the orbit of Mars differs from a perfect circle. So it's not, uh, the orbit of Mars is not a circle, it's an ellipse, which differs about 9% from a circle where Earth's orbit is also an ellipse, but it differs from a circle by only something about one and a half percent or 2%. Um, so the Earth's orbit is uh, uh, much more circular. Uh, the distance from the sun, uh, of course, Mars is further away, about one and a half times 
as far from the sun as the Earth. And uh, that means that the length of the year is going to be much longer. In fact, a, a Mars year is almost twice the length of an Earth year. In terms of size, the mass of Mars is about 11% of the mass of the Earth. Radius is a little bit more than a half, 53%. The density of the planet itself, the average density, is about 71% of the density of the Earth, uh, presumably because there's less iron in the, in the center of, of Mars. And the surface gravity, because of the combination of the density and the size of Mars, is a little bit more than a third, so 38% of the surface gravity of the Earth. Uh, that might mean it'd be interesting to hold a track meet there where people could throw the javelin and high jump and uh, extraordinary distances until they collapse because of surface pressure and lack of oxygen. But then we do only we get one try, I guess. The top topography height on Mars is more than, on the average, is more than double what it is on Earth. The largest mountain on Mars, or actually it's a volcano, is almost three times as large as, uh, as uh, Mount Everest. And the surface pressure is extremely low, less than 1%, six millibars compared to the Earth's 1,000 millibars. Uh, this makes it, uh, this, this could cause some, some problems. Now Mars has been uh, in the culture for many, many years. Uh, here are some examples. Uh, most of these are pretty recent examples. Uh, the first two, uh, War of the Worlds and the Martian Chronicles are of the fiction stories by two of the uh, most famous uh, science fiction writers, H.G. Wells and Ray Brad, uh, Bradbury. Uh, the third one is, I guess, Mars is more of a metaphor. Hope it's a metaphor. Hope, hopefully I'm not from Mars. Uh, it's that uh, men tend to have Martian, what we consider to be Martian characteristics according to the uh, superstitions and women more like Venus. Uh, anyhow, it's the fact that it was used as a metaphor suggests that this, this is pretty popular in our culture. Uh, the, my favorite Martian of uh, the TV show, it's a, allegedly a comedy, it was, it, it was amusing. That was on for several years. The Martian is a fairly recent uh, movie and a four or five years old starring Matt Damon. And I'll talk about this a little bit in a, in a couple minutes. Mars Attacks was a uh, sort of science fiction comedy, but it had a very good cast, including Jack Nicholson. Uh, uh, the, there was supposed to be a, a, a series called Mars on TV uh, by, uh, a, by National Geographic. Uh, this lasted about a year before it kind of fizzled out. It was not at all successful as a, as a series. And Mars has also entered into the root realm of art and music uh, holds the planets, the first act, the very first movement uh, called Mars and it, uh, it kind of represents the, uh, the uh, more the uh, Mars as, as a god rather than Mars as a planet. Now War of the Worlds uh, of course was written by H.G. Wells and there was a radio broadcast in 1938 I believe uh, that was narrated by Orson Welles, uh, uh, no relation, they don't even spell the names the same. Uh, and this is on the radio and, and people heard the radio show, they went into a panic. They didn't realize that the Mars evasion in the story was not real and uh, it caused a panic and, uh, uh, and so, uh, so, so okay, uh, uh, the, the movie The Martian, which came out just uh, several years ago, the story about surviving on Mars. Uh, the, the hero Matt Damon gets stuck on Mars and, and how do you survive and uh, what one has to go through and how one prepares for survival is really what the story is about. Also this international cooperation in that movie, uh, the, I hope I'm not going to tell you what the ending is, the, uh, the, 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 the Chinese uh, were very helpful in, with, with the Americans, with NASA, and causing a uh, a, uh, a successful some success in in the movie. Well, one of the things that happened in, in Martian was it begins with a a, a storm on Mars, which causes uh, the uh, Matt Damon to get stranded there. 
and this uh, this windstorm caused so much damage that the rest of the crew had to leave. Steve, are you still talking? We can't. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't. Whoops. Steve, yeah. Well, you have to turn it on to hear. I can hear you, Steve. You can. I can. Yeah, your your sound is fine. It's probably a problem with the person's computer if they. Yeah, if they can't hear you, yeah, I can hear you it's fine. not you. Fine. Okay. Sorry, guys and ladies. The, the main point here is that uh, The Martian, of course, is, is fiction. This movie is, is, is a fictional portrayal of what might or, or could happen. Now, in a lot of these fictional movies, one can uh, sort of uh, poke at some of the uh, inconsistencies or errors, scientific errors. And that really does not concern me very much. This is a, a movie, it's fiction, and the idea is, uh, is planning, surviving, the importance of technology, international cooperation, not so much of trying to learn science. Uh, however, this is an area that I actually studied is uh, winds on Mars. And uh, because of the low air density, less than 1% of, of, of the Earth's air density, uh, uh, wind that picks up fine dust it's not going to do a whole lot of damage. It's a, it's a, it's not a whole lot of momentum associated or energy associated with the, uh, with, with the wind and in, in the, in the, uh, in the dust particles. And the wind speed would need to exceed hundreds of miles per hour. I'm just guessing around 500 miles an hour. So I don't know exactly how big these dust particles are, but studies have shown that the winds on Mars rarely exceed 100 miles an hour. 100 miles an hour, of course, is a, is sort of a. Uh, Weak as well, it's maybe a moderate, weak to moderate hurricane, but with the atmosphere, with the density of the air being so low on Mars, it's hard to believe that this could sort of uh, cause as much damage as indicated in the movie. Uh, but that, that that's okay. Uh, this, this is the movie, and if it didn't do very much damage, that there wouldn't be a movie. Yep. Uh, uh, Mars actually has entered into the into the arts as well of course for the most part it's the uh, the mars there is the god the uh, the roman god mars it's a pretty famous painting by botticelli of venus and mars uh, i think i know which is which uh, uh, also uh, in the ancient ancient world uh, i guess mars was was thought of very very highly and so people made statues and here's uh statues representing uh the second century a.d and i'm not sure when they, when they went on the left is a bronze statue but and mars has been in the public's mind for a long time either a, a, as a god or as a planet sometimes both Now, a lot of us, when we read our history books, we think, oh, we know what, what, what study of Mars. We know a few names from the Roman Empire or, or from, well, I guess, Greece and Rome and Egypt and so forth. But a lot of the other cultures also make contributions to our understanding of Mars. We tend to uh, uh, not really give them enough credit or think about them. Uh, here are some of them. Uh, of course, there's Babylonia, because Greece and Egypt and India are not a surprise in this list. Uh, uh, in India, uh, they realize that the Earth rotates, and the in the Moon and the planets are seen via reflected light. That is, they don't, they don't shine on, on it with their own energy as as the Sun. Uh, uh, the, the Mayans and and Persia also had some uh, some uh, contributions. I was much surprised to see uh, Persia. Apparently, they discovered or actually described the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, and I don't know if they knew it was a galaxy or really what it was. But anyhow, there was a lot of interest in, in astronomy and in particular the planets back in those days. Okay, I'm just going to uh, list, list a few names. Um, a name you're familiar with, uh, uh, Aristotle. Uh, he believed the planets encircled the Earth. He, he believed in not a sun-centered solar system, but an Earth-centered solar system. Uh, and that persisted for, well, 
but we'll, we'll, we'll see that a little bit later. But he did realize that Earth is a sphere. He did that by looking at uh, like lunar eclipses and noticed that the, in a lunar eclipse, you could sort of see the, uh, the, the shadow of the Earth and the shadow of the Earth, because it looks like an arc of a circle. Uh, but he knew that the Earth was three-dimensional. And uh, in those days, they believed that anything that sort of was sphere-ish had to be a sphere. They believed in uh, the perfection of, of the basic uh, three-dimensional figures in geometry. He also noticed that the Mars disappeared behind the moon. And of course, what that means is that the moon is closer to us than is Mars. The main thing is that people were interested in the relationship among the planets and, and, and within the solar system. Let's see if I can pronounce these names correctly. Eratosthenes, this is around 250 BC plus or minus. Uh, he actually was a, a more of a geometer than astronomer. No, not uh, geographer, I'm sorry, more of a geographer than astronomer. He uh, estimated the size of the earth by using shadows, uh, uh, put up uh, like sticks in, uh, in two, different, two different latitudes and noticed that the, uh, the length of the shadows it differed, and from that you could create a, a model using circles of how how big the Earth is. This is back in 250 BC. Uh, of course, a lot of us learned that Columbus and people in the Columbus's day thought the Earth was flat. I, uh, maybe they still do. Maybe they still do. Maybe, maybe they did then. But certainly the uh, uh, the, the scientists and the, and the natural philosophers did not believe that. They knew that the Earth. Uh, was was around. Now, Aristarchus uh, proposed the idea of the fact that the sun is at the center of the solar system and the planets just rotate or revolve around the sun about the same time that Aristosthenes. Uh, uh, that's sort of interesting since that was still an issue even up to the, what, what Galileo's time, talking about almost 2,000 years later. But uh, this goes back to Aristarchus and, and probably some other people. One of the things that the ancients recognized was that the planets, because some people wander, the planets uh, seem to move in, 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 in the sky relative to the constellations. So if you're facing, uh, if every night you look at the same constellations, because the constellations are gonna move around because the earth is rotating around, revolving around the sun, you see the planets sort of moving you know, along pretty much a, a smooth, smooth curve. And then they kind of double back, and then they double back again. Now, the stars do not do that. They kind of go around in, uh, in essentially circular motion from our point of view. So they recognize that, the, uh, that these objects, like Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, uh, were, were not stars, they were planets. Now, what happens when we see something that we don't understand? Well, we take whatever model that we have and we fudge it. I would never do that. Uh, but well, he said, uh, but what Ptolemy did is to account for this retro, what's called retrograde motion. At first, the stars seem to be moving in one direction. They sort of double back and they sort of double back again. And this more complicated motion was uh, accounted for by incorporating epicycles. We'll see a little bit more of that in one of the videos. This is something that the, uh, that the ancients knew about. I don't think they thought about the same that we do now, but they did recognize that the planets seem to move differently than the, than the stars. So as, as I said before, uh, uh, people uh, realized, uh, even the ancients realized that there's evidence for a spherical Earth. Um, one reason is that the if you move from north, if you move north, excuse me, if you move south, the, the constellations appear to move north. In other words, they get higher and higher in the sky. Uh, well, if the Earth were flat, that wouldn't happen. They would stay about the same level. The shadows change length as one travels from north to south or, or vice versa. That's how one 
to determine that the uh, uh, estimate for the rays of the Earth. What the people probably noticed first was that the, if you're watching ships moving away from you, uh, they don't just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, what happens is that the uh, the lower portion of the ships disappear as they get smaller. The lower portion of ships disappear completely. In other words, the uh, uh, the ships are, are are moving along the the sphere. Of course, this so sort of scared people. They thought, oh gosh, look at that. If the lower portion of ships are disappearing, um, then that means they must be over the edge of the Earth, and we'll never see them again. Also, they notice that the if you look at the at lunar eclipse of the Terminator, um, the the, uh, the shape of, of that terminator during uh, uh, at the edge of, edge of the edge of, uh, edge of the Earth's shadow is does not correspond to the Earth being um, being flat. So there's a lot of evidence that these ancients uh, knew about. Okay. You're also nice and quiet. I guess that happens when you turn off the turn off your sound. More detailed information about our dominant celestial nature. Using mathematics, the ancient Greeks provided more detailed information about our dominant celestial neighbors, the sun and moon. Even back then, 2,000 years ago, they knew that the Earth curves. And by looking at the shadows, they calculated the size of the Earth to within about 10% accuracy. They had actually calculated the distance from the Earth to the Moon and the rough dimensions of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So in other words, the ancients were no fools. The ancient Greeks also recognized two types of stars. Most were fixed and small and moved together. A few were larger and moved haphazardly, or so it seemed. These were planets, and predicting their motion became a centuries-long goal. With just their naked eyes to scan the skies, the Greeks saw only five planets, naming each after their gods. Today, we're more familiar with their Roman designations, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter. Ancient astronomy assumed a concept of the universe proposed by 4th century BC Greek philosopher Aristotle, who imagined the Earth at the center of the universe with the sun, moon, stars, and planets all revolving elegantly around it in perfect crystalline spheres. Aristotle's universe was finite. It was a big sphere. Actually, it was like onion. It was an onion with many concentric spheres. First century astronomer Ptolemy improved on Aristotle, accurately tracing the paths of the planets, which didn't move after all. Using complex circular motions called epicycles, Ptolemy could predict their prescribed paths and changing velocities. In other words, Ptolemy's system reliably predicted the future behavior of the planets, another step in man's journey to understand and control the universe. The Ptolemaic system was extremely complex. It had all these planets going in loops, and it worked beautifully, but it was just wrong. The idea uh, that you can predict something doesn't mean you and the fundamental principles behind it. Ptolemy's system did not accurately reveal the universe, but it didn't try. He essentially showed that the positions of the planets could be calculated for any time past or future. It was a tour de force of mathematical understanding. Interestingly, the astronomy seemed to stand still for centuries after that. In fact, after the collapse of Rome in 476 AD, 
astronomy actually lost ground. Europe fragmented into smaller powers, and a lot of the wisdom of the Greeks was lost. A thousand years later, a new theory would confront accepted beliefs about how the heavens worked and would move mankind one step closer to a theory of the Big Bang. Okay, here's a, uh, here's a slide on, on, on Ptolemy from Egypt. And I find it interesting is this quote, we consider it a good principle to explain the phenomena by the simplest hypothesis possible. Now this was back in the second century. Uh, now in the 1300s, Occam, Occam's Razor says essentially, the simpler of two explanations is usually correct. That's not exactly what Ptolemy is saying, but it's awfully close. And this goes, this of course is more than a thousand years later. This is sort of one of the uh, theories in, uh, 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 the, in uh, the Carl Sagan's movie uh, where the, there was some issue between a, a religious woman and this is a, a woman who believes in science and a man who believes in, in religion and how they come together. And Occam's razor is one of the things that they talk about a lot. Now Ptolemy uh, did write a, a treatise on ast astronomy. Uh, he actually he generated a star catalog and as the video showed, the uh, planetary hypothesis was one of nested spheres. Uh, people in those days, even to some degree even now, People like to think of the universe being considered of really the beautiful geometry that the Greeks uh, developed uh, you know, a few hundred years before Ptolemy, but it actually has persisted. It even persisted to, uh, to when uh, uh, to, to, to later when, when people actually had, had developed a more scientific approach to the structure of the, of the solar system. Okay, as promised, uh, it's about the right time, I guess, that we have a eight, nominal eight minute intermission. It could be a minute or two longer or shorter. In order to pass the time away, you can go, get, go to the restroom, go get something to eat or, or drink, or just listen to the music and see if I can find it here. Hope everybody can hear this. Classified documents reveal the extent to which the FBI views the FISA spy warn system. I don't know if you remember, but back in the spring of 2016, the FBI was in a. Sorry about that.
Okay, folks, uh, thanks for your attention and uh, hope you enjoy that musical in, in interlude. Um, I'm sure you could tell that the, uh, uh, the, the tone of the, of the music was uh, reflected the, uh, the Romans god, uh, Mars. Okay, we have about 30, well, 30, 35 minutes left. So let's move on to the next phase of, 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 of the course.
this is looking at the Renaissance. Now we're moving from you know a few hundred A.D. up into the fourteen uh, hundreds, uh, and as the one of the video indicated, uh, there was a, some, a large gap in uh, progress in understanding the solar system in in in, in, in those days. Come the Renaissance, so things change very quickly. Uh, the picture, of course, is a is, is Florence, it's Florence, Italy, and we're looking at uh, particularly uh, five uh, five scientists: Copernicus, uh, Tycho Brahe, uh, Johann Kepler, uh, Galileo, and Sir Isaac Newton. The Co Copernicus lived in the early 1500s and he developed the heliocentric model of the solar system. Now this wasn't completely new as you saw this had been around for a while but he really looked at it in a lot more detail than had been looked at before. Uh, he interacted with astronomers and was able to do his work because he had uh, uh, an appointment that was kind of like a fellowship uh, that allowed him to study uh, astronomy uh, without having to worry so much about feeding himself. Seem to have lost one of my videos here. Anyway, the video is just cutting this long. It just shows uh, uh, Copernicus in his late stage of life just talking about what, what he had done. Well, this is a model of the Copernican system. Now, this is a because a circle and the sun's in the middle. There is Mercury and Venus. There's the Earth with its moon, and moving a little bit, we get Mars, Jupiter with its four large moons, and uh, there's Saturn there. Now, clearly, this was not designed by Copernicus because uh, Galileo discovered those four moons, and Copernicus came many well came be, be, be before. Uh, before Galileo. So this must be someone's rendition of the Copernican system, but not actually designed by Copernicus himself. Uh, two of my favorite astronomers are Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler. And uh, it's not clear that they really were good friends, but they put them together in a statue in, in Prague to honor what, what they had done. Now, Tycho Brahe, uh, uh, died in 1601, so his late 1500s. He came from Denmark. He moved to Prague in 1592, where he stayed for nine years. He had his own model of the solar system. It was not Earth-centered. It was not Sun-centered. There's some hybrid. The planets go around the Sun, except for the Earth, but the Sun uh, revolves around the Earth. So he got most of it right, but not quite. He had the greatest, he had the best data using a, uh, some amazing navigational instruments to measure angles to within 3% uh, of one degree. Uh, that's hard for us to even imagine, but you, you, you take a protractor and how small a, a one degree is, imagine what 1% of that one degree is. That's his relief, that was, that was the precision he had. And a comparison, the resolution of the, of the human eye, because it varies from person to person, is about 1% of one degree. That is, uh, 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 what's the smallest distance a person can see um, as, as, a, as a little interval as opposed to a, 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 just a point. Um, so he was only, only a, a little bit above the resolution of the human eye, which means that you really can have done a whole lot better uh, since if you, uh, you, you can't actually measure what you can't see. Uh, this is a, shows a picture of a sextant on the left, 
looks like a little protractor, has a little a viewfinder, a little telescope, and look at the telescope, and then you move the, one of the arms in order to, uh, to, to, to measure angles, just like you would on a protractor on a piece of paper. And on the right, you see uh, somebody who's actually using a, a sextant. Now, at first, when I first thought about this, I said, well, how in the world did, did Brahe uh, uh, collect such great data without the telescope had not even been uh, developed yet, at least not the, not the uh, ones acting enough for him, actually. Uh, and then uh, realized, oh, wait a minute, they had, uh, they had the navigational instruments to measure angles. Because angles were the only thing that they could actually measure from the Earth. One of the issues then is you measure angles, but you, you know where Mars is on a line, but you don't know how you don't know um, how far away it is. And that's something that uh, we'll have to uh, look at what what Kepler did, which is coming up next. This is one of my favorite videos of all time. So it's a little bit on the long side. We'll be watching about 12 or 13 minutes of it. Uh, so ahead of time, this is the, it begins with a, a lecture in the physics classroom, lecture hall at Caltech. I recognize, since I spent an awful lot of time there, I think Arthur has also spent some time, hopefully, hopefully he did. Studying the orbit of Mars around the sun, Johannes Kepler discovered its path could be explained only if the planet traveled along an ellipse. It was the first of Kepler's three laws. I'm sure you remember that Tycho Brahe had his own system of the universe. In the Tychonic system, the Earth was stationary at the center, the sun went around the Earth, and all of the other planets went around the Sun. Of course, Tycho believed passionately in his own system. And on his deathbed, he begged Johannes Kepler to use the new observations to prove the correctness of the Tychonic system. It was a touching moment. I have no idea of what Kepler thought of that moment. But the idea of doing what Tycho had asked him to do never even crossed his mind. Kepler was a Copernican to his very core. And as soon as he got his hands on Tycho's data, the first thing that he set out to do was to analyze the orbit of Mars. It proved to be enormously difficult. And no matter what he did, he couldn't make the orbit of Mars fit a circle. The disagreement between the angular position of Mars in the sky and the best circular orbit was eight minutes of arc. In other words, if he had tried to do the same thing before Tycho's observations, it would have been possible. But with the new data, it could no longer be made to work. And so Kepler was faced with a direct conflict between the ancient platonic dictum that all motions in the heavens had to be circular motions and the new iconic observations. Faced with that conflict, he made his choice. He chose the observations and he started to search for a different smooth curve that would describe the orbit of Mars. After years of agonizing work, he hit upon the answer. It was a curve that had been known for thousands of years and it's called an ellipse. In the most graphic terms, a piece of string and two pins illustrate the simple elegance of an ellipse. Since the string doesn't stretch into a different length, the total distance from one pin to the pencil to the other pin is constant. A single point is called the focus. Two points, the foci. The length of the semi-major axis is A. The semi-minor axis has the length B. 
the region bounded by the ellipse has area pi AB. The distance from the center to either focus is some fraction of A, EA. The symbol E represents the amount of eccentricity. As in the social context of the word, eccentricity means somewhat off-center. So when E shrinks to zero, when there's no eccentricity, the result is a perfectly rounded figure, an ellipse called a circle. But when E increases, the ellipse becomes increasingly eccentric and increasingly flat. Focus is the Latin word for fireplace. It was first used for the ellipse by a man who became known as the wandering mathematician. His name was Johannes Kepler. And in the sun, he saw the greatest fireplace in the universe. In his emotional life, however, particularly as a child, he saw very little in the way of warmth. Kepler's father, a low ranked soldier of fortune, deserted the family early. His mother was later tried for witchcraft, although it's not known whether Kepler Sr. fled because she had the makings of a real witch. In his father's absence, Johannes was constantly visited by poverty and despite his mother's alleged charms, by illness as well. His background challenges many contemporary notions about heredity and environment. Though he displayed the skill and curiosity of mathematical genius, Johannes Kepler seemed an unlikely candidate to solve some fundamental problems of the universe. Early in his career, Kepler taught schoolboys in Graz on the Murr River in southeastern Austria. Like many before and since, he found teaching more frustrating than rewarding. He struggled with geometrical models of planetary motion, but soon realized his astronomical data were not reliable enough. At the dawn of a new century, January 1st, 1600, Kepler set off in search of the most accurate astronomical data on Earth and the man who possessed them, Tycho Brahe. Born into the let them eat cake class of society, Tycho surprised Danish nobility with his decision to do something worthwhile. His penchant for astronomy became his reward. And for the last 38 years of his life, he charted the heavens with extraordinary precision. No one on earth appreciated the potential value of Tycho's heavenly observations better than Johannes Kepler. To him, the data were essential, the key unlock the door to the universe and to reveal what he called the secrets of the skies. But much to Kepler's dismay, Tycho knew how to keep a secret. So Kepler struggled without Tycho's precious data for almost two years. Then on October 24th, 1601, fate stepped in. Tycho's dying words were, let me not seem to have lived in vain. The Danes family withheld the data, but Kepler managed to make Tycho's last wish come true. Advancing science more than ethics, all the material. Otherwise mild mannered little mathematician was finally ready in his own words to wage my war on Mars. Mars, the red planet. Mars, an early Roman god of agriculture and of war. Mars through the ages, powerful and mysterious. Within the ancient world's concept of the Earth-centered universe, planets moved in epicycles, and sometimes, as with Mars, the epicycles were very erratic. To account for such erratic behavior, Tycho conceived his own universe. Tychonic solar system. Like Ptolemy, he placed the Earth at the center with the sun revolving around it. But like Copernicus, Tycho had the other planets orbiting the sun. While Tycho's system fit the appearances more simply than Ptolemy's, Kepler passionately embraced the views of Nicholas Copernicus. 
not only an unpopular view, Galileo would be tried in Rome for sharing it, it was an extremely difficult one to justify scientifically. Consider the Copernican solar system and the problems it presented Johannes Kepler. From Copernicus's revolutionary viewpoint, Kepler had to make mathematical observations from a planet that, rather than being central and stationary, was in motion with all the other planets. Imagine the difficulty of trying to compute the orbit of Mars from a moving platform, a platform that spins on its axis in a non-circular orbit, constantly varying velocity and with an unknown center. This was Kepler's dilemma, and he approached it with a poetic faith in a logical universe. Do we ask what profit the little bird hopes for in singing? Kepler asked. Surely this question expressed his view of the purpose for which he had been created, to discover the secret of the skies. Just as some creatures seem to have been created to sing, Kepler seems to have been created to calculate. And his calculations, which totaled over 900 pages, were enormously difficult. His war on Mars was a patient siege in which many of his weapons were imperfect and faulty, but he employed them with a striking brilliance. For example, to find the location of his moving platform, Kepler used observations of Mars as it returned, Mars year after Mars year, to the same point in its orbit. Then he reversed them to find the orbit of the Earth By finding a circle, even though it wasn't quite centered on the sun, Kepler had taken a step in the right direction. So now, once again, he attacked the problem of Mars. Still unable to find its exact path, he did manage to find something suggestive in its irregular speed. Mars moved faster when it was closer to the sun and slower when it was farther away. This would become Kepler's second law but he still hadn't found his first law. Approximately every two years, the sun, the earth, and Mars are in opposition. In other words, seen from either the earth or the sun, the position of Mars is the same. With another observation, one Mars year later, Kepler could triangulate a precise point on the orbit of Mars. Could a circular orbit, even one offset from the sun, fit all of the points? Almost, but not quite. That is, not within the unparalleled precision of Tycho Brahe's observations. the secret of the heavens. With the sun at one focus, an oval orbit, a slightly distorted circle was called And that type of orbit was an ellipse. The ellipse, known to the ancient Greeks and finally rediscovered in the heavens by Johannes Kepler, can be viewed time and time again right here on Earth. It's simply a matter of looking at things in the right perspective. Any circle. Okay, folks, I, I stopped the uh, video there since uh, we'll run out of time if, if we go through the rest of it. My favorite line on this, of course, is 
uh, Kepler saying he was trying to wage his war on Mars, which I think is very interesting since Mars is the Roman god of war. Um, Yeah, Kepler, uh, they developed a, a th a th three laws. The first one we've just seen, the orbits are elliptical, or at least they can be modeled by ellipses. Of course, they're not perfect ellipses since uh, the planets will interact with each other and, and push them away from a perfect ellipse, but the, the model seemed to have worked. Um, second law, they quantify each planet moves faster when closer to the sun. This relates different locations in the same orbit. So if you know what's happening at one point on the orbit of Mars or any planet, uh, you can determine a, a relationship at some other point. So you're able to relate points on the same orbit. This also applies to moons around this planet. We can do the same thing with our moon or moons of some of the other planets. The third one is really interesting. It says there's a relationship between the period, that is uh, the length of the year and the distance in the sun is the uh, same for all planets. That allows uh, us to determine, a, allows us to compare uh, measurements among the planets. So if you know something about uh, one of the planets, say, say Jupiter, then you can determine other things about Jupiter by using the third law. Uh, these, these are laws, they are not hypotheses, they're not theories, they really are laws, and the laws is, is a one way to think about it is a summary of observational data. It does not explain uh, what, what's happening, uh, why there are ellipses, why they move in the way they do, just it's an explanation of what they see in terms of things that people already know, like ellipses, nor is it really a, a theory, it does not explain why, why they go and why the orbits are ellipses. If Kepler had used his method for any planet besides Mars, say Venus or Jupiter or Saturn, he would determine that within the accuracy of, of the data that he had, he could not distinguish a circular orbit from an elliptical orbit. In other words, all the orbits look like they're a circle. Uh, and he would have missed the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the first law completely since uh, Mars is sufficiently uh, eccentric that the the ellipse is, is necessary. The ellipse is not a circle. It's very, very, that's very, very forward. This happens it seems like quite a bit in science that the people get a little bit lucky at times, but if you know what you're doing and you uh, uh, have, have good data and in, in a good mind, then one can uh, get around some of the issues of, uh, of luck. Now, Kepler was not perfect. Uh, uh, his model of the solar system was a, so a geometric model. Of course, the geometry was a, a big issue in mathematics uh, uh, through, uh, even before the Renaissance and even during the Renaissance. There are six known planets and there are five regular geometric polyhedra. For example, a, a triangle pyramid, a cube, and there are three others. And so Kepler's model was to have, begin with a sphere, put a, one of these polyhedra inside, put a sphere inside the polyhedra, put a polyhedra inside the sphere, and so forth. Uh, there are uh, five polyhedra, and so that means that this only works if you have uh, six, only have six, six planets. In other words, only, uh, you can use six spheres with polyhedra inside, but if there was a seventh planet, then this model would not work. Well, we've, of course, I found since then that we have uh, two other planets in the solar system, Uranus and, and Neptune. So Kepler's polyhedra model of, of the orbits, as beautiful as it is for some interest in geometry, really does not fit the data. Uh, the last of the scientists I like to just discuss this very, very briefly as Galileo Galilei. Of course, uh, I can talk, you know, for all three sessions on, on, on Galileo. He observed four moons of Jupiter. He did not 
invent the telescope. As some people think he used the telescope that had been invented in, um, in, in, in Europe. But what he did, he, he, I guess in the Netherlands, he improved the Dutch telescope from, uh, I think it's about three power up to 30 power. And from that, you can determine a lot of the details. For example, with a 30 power uh, telescope, if you look at either Venus or Jupiter, you'd say, oh, that looks about like the size of the moon. With Venus, a little a bit of problem because it's so bright. It looks like the size of the moon uh, with the naked eye. This, if you look at the moon with the naked eye, you can see some details on the, uh, some dark patches and so forth. The same thing with Venus and Jupiter. Because Venus is closer, but Jupiter is bigger. They sort of basically compensate each other. Mars and Saturn, of course, uh, Mars is smaller than Venus and Saturn is smaller than Jupiter. And so if you look at Mars through a 30 power telescope, it'll look like about half the size of the moon. You can still see some details. You might be able to see the, uh, uh, the ice caps, the, the white at the top and the bottom. You cannot see as much detail as you could with uh, looking at Jupiter. The last of the scientists that will probably break for the day is Sir Isaac Newton. He developed uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so, so, so the, the mechanics and his laws of mechanics really supported Kepler's three laws. So he was able to start with some the equations and not with the data and actually show that each of the three laws of Kepler were in fact correct. Now this is a, a bit after Kepler, he was born a little bit after uh, Kepler had died. Developed the, the law of gravitation. Uh, developed all these areas of, of, of physics and calculus and invented eventually uh, the first reflecting telescope. The first telescopes were the refracting telescopes. The reflecting telescope does have some advantages in, in the design and the manufacture over a, uh, a refracting telescope. And I guess I don't, I'm not talking too much about telescopes. I know we have some experts here. Okay, it's just about the right time. It's about 10 minutes before the end of the, of the class for today. Uh, uh, next time I'll begin with uh, looking at Mars and the, a little bit later in the, the 1800s to 1960, that is the, at the time period just before the, uh, the, the space age, and then move on from there to the, some of the observations that we understand we get from the various uh, 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 ventures to, uh, to the Mars planet. Okay, I'm going to look at see if there are any, are, I guess, uh, Maureen, I guess we should open the mics. Okay, I'm gonna try to unmute everybody. <clears throat> and uh, I'll look at the chat. Hey, everybody's allowed to unmute themselves, so go ahead and do that if you can. <clears throat> Uh, Steve, uh, did, was there anything that you found uh, in in the astronomy of the Arabs or the Persians uh, that that uh, related to Mars? I mean, they were pretty scientifically prolific. Steve, you need to unmute yourself. Steve, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. Is that better? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I did not find anything. It doesn't mean there's no, there wasn't anything. Uh, I did not spend a whole lot of time on that aspect of it because uh, I'm actually a bit more interested in, in the Renaissance and some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the missions to Mars we've had, you know, since 1960. But I, I don't know. Okay. It's hard to believe there isn't. Because the, uh, uh, all, all these ancient civilizations, you know, they, they were pretty clever. It's hard to believe that they would actually miss Mars and and, and make some conjectures about it. But, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I would guess that too. Yeah. As well as some other cultures, I, I just mentioned just a few of them, but I'm sure almost everybody 
was looking looking at the, at the sky. How can you miss it? You go outside, you look up, and uh, in those days, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, of light pollution. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, Sam. That long gap between the ancients and all their findings and their search of the skies uh, um, before Christ, and then you have like, like gosh, a huge gap, thousands, <clears throat> thousands of years. Well, not thousands, but a couple of thousand. Uh, something certainly a big span of time yeah. what was it does anybody conjecture about was it because um wh why weren't there scientists who took the work of these ancients and 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 did more with it why was yeah. there such a gap again th th that's a question unrelated but i'm just curious about that from a different perspective? Yes, a great, great question. I thought about the same thing. I, I kept looking and looking and looking to fill in that gap. Of course, Ptolemy was sort of in that gap, I guess, uh, at a, uh, 100 to 200 um, AD. And, uh, and uh, the Copernicus was, uh, what, about, uh, uh, about a thousand years or 1200 years later. But this, that, that, that's a huge gap. In the video, they suggest that the uh, uh, maybe the fall of the Roman Empire and the uh, uh, was responsible. It's not clear why there weren't individual scientists who were investigating this. That's a good question. Hmm. You think religion had anything to do with it? Um, well, Religion had a lot to do with everything, of course. You know, Galileo had some issues with uh, religion. Um, so it's, it, 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 it is possible that uh, uh, somehow the religion maybe suppressed it, suppressed them, but it didn't seem to stop uh, Kepler or Copernicus or Ptolemy or those folks. So I really don't understand. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, because they, they didn't really have any any instruments besides the... Uh, Can I jump in here? Who, who is this? This, um... this is Lynn. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, from what I understand about science and religion, um, kind of religion kind of put a block on the science, on, well, they didn't call them scientists back in them days, they called them uh, natural philosophers, right? Uh, and science didn't really, and scientists didn't really. That term really didn't come in come in until like the 1800s. Mm -hmm. But uh, like with Galileo, um, he really had a fight with with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, well, yeah, he had you know, a couple of trials <laughs> actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they they put him in. Uh, they didn't. Or well, they had. He put him. They put him under house arrest. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, the, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, mainly back in those days, it was, you know, they were pretty stern about, you know, very conservative as to what, what, how the planets would, would go around. And what's kind of odd today is, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine about astronomy and he was saying, you know, he had found out that the, uh, that the Pope, uh, and Vatican City, it's not in Vatican City, but they have their own observatory. Uh, and, uh, and, their own, and, and I was going, yeah, I think I knew they had their own observatory. It's not in, it's outside of Rome somewhere. Uh, yeah, even uh, Kaplan had some issues with religion. I think right after uh, he made these discoveries about his, his, his three laws, I think a uh, major uh, 30 years war broke out, I don't know, sometime in the six, early, early to mid 1600s. And, uh, and that kind of put his research on, not on hold, but it basically it's into his research, not that long after he had developed his three laws in the early 1600s. So that, you, you probably have a point there that uh, it, uh, it either suffocated some of the scientists or natural philosophers, and you're right, uh, but I, 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 I'm not sure. So it's probably the three wise men were the last time that um, they allow them to come into the um, picture, the magi, uh -oh, yeah. <laughs> the colleges, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm, I should probably stay away from religion. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's it's not it's not really clear. And it may have just been you know cooperation and communication among the different cultures that may have been part of the problem. They're always at war with each other. Oh yeah. Hey. Is this Lynn? Oh, Penny. Penny Young? I, I have a question. This is Tom. Um, hi. Hi, hi, Tom. Hi. I wonder if you have any uh, thoughts about why Aristarchus' heliocentric view uh, was trumped by uh, Ptolemy's and why, you know, his uh, approach didn't take hold. It's not clear uh, where Aristarchus, where he got that idea uh, and what and what basis he had. You know, uh, there weren't any real solid observations. Uh, it, I guess it just seems simpler to him, I'm guessing, that the uh, 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 plants going around in circles made a whole lot more sense than having to fudge it all up with these with these little cycles, uh, uh, that, that's just a okay, that, that's a good point because that idea seemed to kind of drop out uh, for about a thousand years so from Aristarchus to uh, Copernicus. You, you don't see much of uh, of the of that Copernican uh, model uh, being discussed. If I remember, he had um, some of it was related to eclipse uh, data and. Uh, you know that 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 certainly would have been one clue <laughs> that he could have used for a heliocentric approach. Uh, how, how, how's that, Tom? Uh, eclipse. Uh, a lunar, lunar eclipse or solar eclipse? Or, uh, the, moon, moon. the moon covered the sun, and you know the sun, uh, the Earth cast a shadow on the on the moon, and that sort of thing. But I don't quite remember that. I mean, that, that was definitely in their minds, but it's interesting that he had it right, but it didn't end up prevailing in the uh, general zeitgeist. Yeah, if you restrict yourself to only the sun, the moon, and the earth, there are a lot of models that'll work. Yeah. Uh, that's when you have to, when you include the other planets, uh, whether the earth goes around the sun or vice versa, uh, you really just make a whole lot of difference depending on your frame of reference. But you're right. When uh, uh, it is it is surprising that his view was made and then it was dropped. It wasn't clear how much he uh, sort of stood by his view either. How much? Uh, you know, well, they, it, it was rejected by all the journals or not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Good seeing you. So what kind of instruments would the ancients have used? I mean, they didn't have the sextant and those instruments that were used by um, Kepler and so on and so forth, and even people before them. Uh, well, uh, I'd say, because they would use those uh, uh, for navigation. Navigation huh? only. Ah, just a compass. That, that would be yes, easy. I'll use the... Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of that, because uh, what did the ancients have? What did, what, what did they really look at? What did they measure? They would, could measure shadows. They could. They did have astrolabes, and uh, some uh, instruments are quite complicated in the Greek Greek times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, uh, there are other instruments besides the. Uh, 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 the one of the ones we mentioned here. Uh, but, uh, the Zoni came in much later. What, the Sanford? I think the compasses were much later. I think they didn't have anything like uh, uh, magnetic poles. Oh, oh, oh okay. yeah. He, he said compass. I was thinking of for the, the other kind of compass. You're right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. It's amazing they could do what they did with how little they had. Hmm. Yeah. 
it's 301. We could hang around a little bit longer if, if you'd like. I'll leave it up to uh, the boss. Uh, if there's any, any more questions they can ask, yeah. Yeah. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. Good. Really appreciate that. Very Thank you, everybody. Good, uh, good Thank to you, everybody. Uh, Thanks. I'm going to have to leave. Uh, yeah, a couple of my college friends here and graduate school friends here and colleagues and relatives. It's, it's, it's been a blast. Thanks, guys and ladies. Thank, Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank Thanks, Steve. Steve. See you next. Uh, take care. I'm going to end the meeting. I'll send a link out next week. It's the same link as today's, but I'll send it out again anyway, just in case you lost it. Thanks, right? Maureen. Thanks for Have coming. a lovely week. Be safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, I think I just saw my cousin.